All right, next up on the agenda, we have, and I'm probably going to butcher the name, Mary Matsky? Matsky. Matsky. Uh, with KHA, Kansas Hospital Association, and Darna Garwood with the Kansas Foundation for Medical yes. Care, which is the representation for the Kansas Regional Extension Center. Uh, they'll be providing us some updates on uh, state of Kansas activities. Uh, we did invite Missouri as well, but uh, they were unavailable. So hopefully in future uh, events, we'll have some updates on the Missouri uh, side of the, the border as well. Um, Mary um, is a registered nurse and healthcare information technology professional. Uh, she's currently serving as the HIT hospital project director for the Kansas Hospital Education and Research Foundation. Uh, in this role, Mary provides health information consultation, technical assistance and outreach to Kansas critical access and rural hospitals on electronic health records. Mary received a Bachelor of Nursing from Washburn University and a Master's in Information Systems Management from Friends University. Prior to joining KHRF, I guess that's the abbreviation, um, Mary was uh, employed as a Chief Information Officer at a critical access hospital. Other professional experience includes a clinical applications analyst, director of physician clinics, and outpatient services management. Donna has been a uh, registered nurse since 1994 and a certified professional in healthcare quality for 13 years. She earned her Bachelor of Science degree in nursing from Washburn University in Topeka. Uh, she has worked at the Kansas Foundation for Medical Care since 2002. And since 2010, Donna has worked at KFMC as the HIT Regional Extension Center Educator and is now Director of Customer Service and Education for both Kansas Regional Extension Center and Synovium, which, did I pronounce that right? Yeah, Synovium. Synovium, uh, a new company uh, formed uh, to provide consulting services in this space. Uh, Donna has provided technical assistance to many Kansas primary care physicians and their staff on quality improvement and data reporting initiatives. Uh, please uh, take this time to welcome Mary and Donna. Well, thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to be here today and, and meet so many of you uh, fine people. I have a question. Donna and I were discussing trying to understand the audience since we're um, have not been active members of Heart of America Hymns. Can I get a little bit of a show of hands? How many of you are from hospitals? Can you? Okay. Physician practices? All right. And then like other types of IT consulting or? Mary, okay. can you uh, move a little bit closer? Sure. Thank you. Absolutely. And is there anybody else I missed? Students? Do we have some students here today? Okay. Wonderful. Well, I was preparing for this, trying to think of what I could present that would be new and interesting. It's, it's really hard to follow something like an OCR audit and how to prepare for that. So I really like my place on the agenda. But I'm here to give some good news and talk a little bit about where Kansas hospitals are with electronic health records implementation. All right, see if I can. So this is a recent data brief. This information was taken from an ONC data brief, and I have the link on the, the very last page of this, but it was um, based on information from surveys from the American Hospital Association. They sent out an IT supplemental survey, and those of you that are on the hospital industry, hopefully you've completed yours for 2012. If not, I believe there's still time to do that. But the good news is EHR adoption's up. Do I hear a round of applause? Are anybody very excited? Or is this an aha moment for anyone? But I believe thanks to the incentives and meaningful use and the, the focused emphasis on that, you can see that the adoption rate within community hospitals has nearly doubled over the past four years, three years, excuse me. So that's great. Nationwide, it's, a, it's way up. 34.8% nationally, based on survey respondents. Again, it's only as good as the data. All right, now for a little bit of bad news. Whoops, I can't run the thing, that's bad news. This is what it looks like by state. 
So those of you that are in Missouri or from Missouri, you're actually higher than the average. The dark blue means that it, it exceeds the national average of 34.8%. The light blue, which Kansas is included, are those that are less than the national average. The white means there's really no, no real difference. The gray means their data was not valued, not valuable, not valid, excuse me. They didn't trust the data. So there were seven states that were higher. That was Florida, Illinois, Massachusetts, Minnesota, Missouri, Virginia, and Wisconsin. Lower in seven, and you can see it's kind of right there in the middle, including California and um, Montana. So this was based, again, last year's data, responses to surveys. This gives just a little bit more detail of the hospital adoption, self-reported rate of adoption. This is a basic electronic health record. And then the, the highlighted is also then their intent to attest to meaningful use. In Kansas, it was at 22.5% adoption EHR rate. And 71.2% of those indicated that they probably would attest to meaningful use. And this is by the year 2015. So it doesn't mean immediately, but certainly over the next several years. Again, this is last year's data. Um, there are some states that actually indicated 100% of them were going to attest to meaningful use. And you can, you can look at the table, or I believe this will be available. Um, but some of those states only had six hospitals or six respondents, so it's data is only as good again as the information provided. It was interesting that Missouri has um, an adoption rate of 45 percent, but only 52 indicated they were going to test a meaningful use. So I think again, there, you know, maybe a little bit of hesitation about what does this really mean and is it going to be worth it for us? All right, forward. I'll figure this out. So what I wanted to couch that with then is we have gotten preliminary data back from this 2012 survey. It's not been validated, it hasn't been cleaned up a lot, so I don't want to be held to some of the things, but I think we have a pretty good idea of what the trend looks like for Kansas hospitals that have responded to the survey. We've had 113 respond, which is a, a, a really good number, I think. There's 150 hospitals in the entire state, and of that, about 126, I believe, are members of Kansas Hospital Association and fall within to the community hospital. Now, on our survey, we do have responses from um, some mental health facilities, some state hospitals, some um, standalone other kinds of proprietary, like surgical hospitals, et cetera. So, all of that information will be cleaned up, but that is included right now in, in some of the data I'm going to show you. Here we go. Good news. Implementation of electronic health record is dramatically increased in Kansas. It's up 16% for a full EHR. It's dropped 9%, which is certainly as people have implemented modules and updated, they've gone to a full electronic health record. So we're now fairly close to what the national average was last year. We'll see how it works when 2012 data is available for everyone. Um, the rate of those who had no EHR reported was 21% last year. This year it's now 14, 7% improvement in that. And this is the number that I'm a little fuzzy on, but looking at the data that we have reported, it looks like about 85% of our respondents indicate they will attest for meaningful use within the next several years, by 2015, to avoid penalties for in some instances. Is there any questions or anything you guys can? Yes? What's the price of full EHR? Good question. They have it defined in that data report, but it's, it's a complete electronic record, including clinician notes, results um, ordering and viewing, things basically that you need to uh, test a meaningful use. So it would be the pharmacy, it would be CPOE, it would be nursing documentation, order entry, all of those things. So would a partial EHR? Partial would mean they don't have all the modules completely done. 
And again, I'll talk about that in another um, in another slide. But it's a little it's it's there are descriptions provided, but it's some of it is self determined. And so I think you'll see or we see as we look at some of our responses that probably what they answered is really not what the intent of the question was. So any other questions on that? Okay. Since patient engagement and sharing information is becoming such an important part as we move forward into stage two and three and beyond, I looked at also the responses from this year on how many have some of these features. And these are taken from, again, the survey questions. So fairly low numbers. 10% allow patients to view their info online. Downloads even lower. Um, you can see the one I thought was probably a little bit skewed is this request the change to record. In my understanding, it's more of a request for a change to your medical information. But I think looking at the respondents that people were taking it as change my address, change my phone number, update this, and not actually the medical mm -hmm. amendment to a record. Um, you, can, you can see the rest. Almost everyone, or at least over half, are, provide that ability to pay bills online. And that's been a fairly robust feature for quite a, quite a long time. The ability to submit data is uh, really low. And you can, you can see the, the remainder of those there. But those numbers are fairly low. And then the ability to share information outside or with other hospitals or other clinics was another focused type of questions that were asked on this year's survey. And you can see within systems, whether system hospitals or system clinics, you know, about 40%. It varies a little bit depending on what type of uh, information is being shared. Outside is still very low. There's not a lot of sharing between hospitals and outside hospitals or outside clinics. Again, this is um, probably what, what we would expect. And it, the numbers may change slightly as the, the information is more thoroughly gone through. Those who report no data sharing, no exchange with anyone, you can see is about a fourth, fourth to a third. We do in Kansas, I don't know how familiar you are with rural Kansas, but we do have a large um, network of hospitals. For us, that's a large network. It's about 25 to 30 called Great Plains Health Alliance, which is a, a group of hospitals that are all very small, critical access, that host their data in a central system. They have central billing, central management. And so their numbers are included in these sharing of information and sharing of data, which we're talking 113 respondents, so that has a fairly significant impact on, on some of these numbers. Last thing I wanted to um, talk about is a little bit is the vendors. And again, Kansas has 83 critical access hospitals and a significant number of what we call rural health facilities that are hospitals 50 beds and under. And so this is what, um, these are the major vendors in, in our state or in the state of Kansas, CPSI and uh, Siemens. And, and you mentioned, Gretchen said, they have Siemens Mid-Series 4. The Great Plains Health Alliance hospitals use Siemens Mid-Series 4. Again, it's a hosted type of model. Uh, Meditech is, is fairly significant as well, and you can, uh, you can look at the data otherwise. But we ask them inpatient, outpatient, and for those that had clinics, what were their clinic vendors? And so these, again, this is hospital respondents. This is not physician practices. We're asking the hospitals for this information. So um, we're seeing an increase in a couple of different vendors out in small and rural hospitals. We're seeing a number of Cerner installs that have been purchased, and as well, NextGen is making somewhat of an inroad into the small and the critical access hospitals. A few of those are, are slated for this upcoming year. Is there any questions about this information? Okay. Last thing, I'll put a, a, one little plug in. This is what 
we are sponsoring from Kansas Hospital Association. It's called our EHR Toolkit. Don't know how much value it is to some of you in the metropolitan area, but it certainly is something that our rural hospitals have found valuable. There's a variety of forms and tools and suggestions for um, templates for contracting, that type of thing. And this particular section is called Connect. It allows you to see either by region or by vendor who has what particular product. And then it provides their contact information. And so as we receive the information from our survey, we will be updating this. It gives a meaningful use score, that type of thing. And you can, uh, it is a secure site, and you can obtain permission to it by clicking on a link and, and having a password and um, login set up. And it's accessible right here from our, our HIT website at KHA. There's the, the link. We have a direct link. It's www.hithelp.info. And the last part is the uh, link to the data brief. They also have one out on critical access in rural hospitals. And there's my contact information. Thank you. You want to take over, Donna? Find the PowerPoint. Hi. Could you please back up to the patient engagement slide? Sure. I think. Right there, there you are. Yeah. I'm, I'm going <clears throat> to I'm going to speak as as a very active member of the Society for Participatory Medicine mm -hmm. and as a national patient advocate here. And I'm going to tell you that this slide very clearly shows me what hospitals think of engaging patients. You want to make bloody well sure we can pay our bill, and you don't significantly care about any other engagement with us. So I hope everyone in this room looks closely at this slide, burns into their skull that you don't reach 25% on a single thing but paying my bill. As a patient, I'm absolutely outraged. This is ridiculous. You know, I think the use of patient portals is a very new concept, and it's now being required. Well, it certainly is in, in the hospital setting. Uh, I feel that 10 years ago, not a good time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, absolutely. The only health interoperability that's 100% guaranteed to work in healthcare is I can send a bill and get paid. Right. I can't share data with another provider. By God, you can send my bill. Mm -hmm. Think about that. That's true. All of us that's true. Well, in our um, future events uh, later this year, we'll be talking about uh, accountable care organizations, <laughs> HI, health information exchanges, mm -hmm. those types of things. So. Hopefully, we'll have some more folks to address that directly with the hospitals and the private uh, providers out there. Yeah, I, I know there's lots of movement that way because I'm working on it. This yeah. is just my pep talk as a patient. Yeah. So. <laughs> Do we have another question yeah. in the back? Can you go to the slide um, shows the map of uh, the state of Kansas? That one? No, of, of Kansas. The, We're of, Kans the of Kansas. Oh, sure, at the very end, yeah. yeah. That one. Talk about that again. What does that show? This, what does that show? This is a screenshot from our EHR toolkit, which is a product that we use the funds to help develop. So the the lines that you see are hospital districts in Kansas. And so um, as you go to this site, you have the option, and it's actually a shared site with Missouri as well. So you can pick your site, you can pick your state. And then you can go over and you can select a region on the map and say, show me all vendors in the northeast part of Kansas, in that northeast district. Or you can pick a vendor and say, show me all Meditech hospitals. And it will bring up a list then of all the hospitals that have Meditech and contact information as reported on our survey. It's only as good as the survey responses that we get. Do you know if other states have something similar to that? I don't. I don't know. And we have to set up a uh, an account, username, yes. password, all of that. Right. 
anyone can do that? Or, or just um, hospital members? I think we, we restrict it to hospital members and then participants with the regional extension center. So if it's a physician clinic that is participating with the Kansas or the Missouri Regional Extension Center. So vendors can't do it? No. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I'll hang out here. I'm not sure how you Morning. Um, that was a nice segue into the reason I'm here today. Mar uh, Mary mentioned the Regional Extension Center. Um, I do need to say one thing. Uh, as I noticed my slides this morning, I looked at it. I have a fairly new title, which is Director of Customer Service and Education. So I'm not quite sure where the relations came from, but just in case you want to contact me in the future. Um, I am, uh, my name is Donna Garwood, and I am a registered nurse by education and training. Um, that was my second career choice. My first career choice was an elementary school um, teacher, and I did that for just um, a few years. But um, the two have uh, merged together quite well in the work that I've done over the last several years in working with uh, physician practices. So that was supposed to generate a laugh. It was supposed to be a joke. But um, actually, I, uh, I accidentally did that in front of a group of mental health professionals, and they just started laughing. And I really didn't know why they were laughing until I kind of put the two together. And they said, I said, what in the world? What, what did I say? What's so funny? And they said, well, we're a little bit smarter than kindergartners. I said, OK, I'll give you that. But, um, I have been um, at KFMC, Kansas Foundation for Medical Care, which is um, has existed for over 40 years, and it, uh, KFMC is a private, not-for-profit organization. Um, we are, are uh, totally a contract-based um, organization, so the majority of our contracts are with the federal and state government. Um, we have um, we are known as what is called the Quality Improvement Organization for the state of Kansas. So if you're familiar with the QIO program, um, that's what KFMC does in Kansas. And then, as mentioned in my bio, in February of 2010, um, we are, were awarded the grant from the Office of the National Coordinator to become the Regional Extension Center for the state of Kansas. Um, how many of you are familiar with the role of the Regional Extension Center as part of the High Tech Act and the work towards meaningful use? OK, good, good, a good number of you. I am going to um, try and go the right way because yeah, I watched Mary. Um, I'm not, um, um, Mary and I didn't particularly jive together on our presentations. And so um, there is data out there as far as um, specific numbers of, of physicians in Kansas that have attested or um, uh, and, and, and who have received dollars on the CMS website. What I did do, about the time Linda contacted me for um, to do this presentation, um, the two reports that I'm referencing here in this presentation um, had just been released, and so I thought it was appropriate data to kind of follow through um, what we believe uh, some of this is the impact of the regional extension centers working with physician practices across the country, but also just to kind of give you an idea of where Kansas is compared to other states. And this is one where we actually shine, outshine, yay. We don't always see that. Um, but um, in this particular slide shows that those um, four, one, two, five states, six, seven, seven states that are darker blue are ones who have um, uh, the office-based physicians through a survey, survey method have indicated that they do intend to participate in the meaningful use and setting programs. So basically, this data comes from those people who actually go out to the CMS uh, website and register, um, have registered. And um, actually, I'm, that's wrong. That comes up later. This is just from the survey data that's um, that is um, done. So we're ahead of we're ahead of um, most of the country in that regard. Then this one shows the um, percentage of physicians um, who intend to participate in the program who had 
AHR is capable of meeting the meaningful use, or, or at least the majority of the meaningful use um, core measures. So again, you can see that Kansas is about 32%. Um, the difference here in colors is whether the data was a reliable estimate or not. Most of the country apparently was able to provide a reliable estimate. So of the percentage of um, docs uh, or physician practices who said that they were going to participate in the program, 32% of them at the time have EHRs that are capable of actually meeting the requirements of the program. So there's a, a little gap there. This was... Um, Another um, piece of information, and I do have the links to the sources that I've used. Um, this was very interesting to see um, when you think, uh, again, about the impact that the Regional Extension Center program could have on some of this data. The Regional Extension Center programs across the country, I should have mentioned, um, we are the Regional Extension Center for Kansas, but there are 62 Regional Extension Centers across the country. Some of them, like um, Kansas covers the whole state of Kansas, Missouri's um, uh, covers the whole state of Missouri. Some are just a city, like within Illinois, Chicago. Um, Texas, I think, has four different regional extension centers. So each regional extension center defined their territory based on how many um, priority primary care providers they felt like they could impact. But all of those regional extension centers started our work in um, early um, 2010. And so um, this graph, I think, shows um, some impact of what some of that work is, as well as just the, in general, the education and information that's out there about using EHRs and the meaningful use and sending dollars. So on this um, chart, you can see that um, the e-prescribing um, doubled in this time period so that um, it represented a 119 percent increase. Now, obviously, um, the e-prescribing incentive program and then the um, payment adjustments that are now occurring for that program has surely impacted that as well. But um, so there's a, a lot of things coming together here. But um, it's a good sign because e-prescribing definitely, I think, is a function that you can pretty much say improves um, the safety, patient safety kind of issues of, of a lot of the EHR capabilities. Um, e-prescribing is probably um, one of the best to, to support um, patient safety. But you can see computerized um, provider order entry for medication orders, uh, which was is what is required for meaningful use stage one. Uh, you're, you're, for stage two, you have to um, do that for lab and radiology orders. Uh, drug interaction checks, um, which is kind of the, the blue line there, I think or the blue or the purple line, it's kind of hard to tell, those two are pretty close. Maintain a problem list. And then the clinical decision support rule, um, which for meaningful use stage one is that you only have to choose one clinical decision support rule um, in addition to the required drug, drug, drug allergy check. For meaningful use stage two, you actually have to choose five clinical decision support rules as well as have drug, drug, and drug allergy checks in place. So anyway, I thought that was uh, interesting to see how that's trending. This is a, another chart that shows you for some of the meaningful use um, measures kind of uh, what's happened um, between 2011 and 2012. Um, and you can see that on this chart, um, for the for the patient advocate in in the room, you can see that the clinical summaries to patients um, is one that um, really grew between the two years. And even though those clinical summaries aren't don't necessarily have to be provided electronically, they can be a paper summary. At least the point there is that if we can get providers um, completing and documenting their care at point of care, then that information can be immediately provided to patients. And um, so I think that's a good indication that we're going the right direction anyway. We may not be getting there as fast as we all like, but we're going the right direction. This is, um, again, on some of the meaningful use uh, stage one core objectives, an idea of uh, the number of physicians who have the capabil computerized capabilities to meet those objectives. And you can go down about two-thirds of the list and see that for the, I think it's the top nine or so, 
um, measures, about two thirds of the physicians have the capability to do those kinds of things. Uh, and, and you can see e-prescribing and computerized physician order entry, which is, is potentially CPOE, is potentially another one that can help um, impact patient safety kind of issues. Um, but we have a good percentage of um, providers there, and then clinical summaries to patients. Um, clinical quality measures, you heard in my bio that I've worked a lot with clinical quality improvement, um, KFMC, that's um, a lot of the work that we've done. Um, and so um, that, that's something that we know um, is kind of a work in progress as well. So. Percent of physicians with computerized capabilities to meet meaningful use stage one, the menu items, and the stage two um, objectives. These, um, for those of you familiar with meaningful use, we're currently in stage one and there were 10 menu set items, and of those 10 providers had to report on five. Most of those menu items are now core or required measures for meaningful use stage two. So this was, I thought, um, a good piece of information to just kind of see where people were already at with those menu set items. So on, I'm going to flip my page here. So this you on the you want to look at the um, top two record electronic notes and patient records. Um, about three quarters of physicians have the capability now to do that in their systems, and that's up about 66 percent, 68 percent from 2009. So you can kind of see that growth. And then computerized physician order entry for lab orders. Um, again, about um, six out of every ten physicians are doing that, and that's up about 68 percent. So. Um, the ones obviously that don't have data weren't measured um, at the time that this was put together. Um, secure messaging with patients, again, is something that um, is increasing. Um, and as uh, we'll hear more about Meaningful Use Stage 2, is a requirement that um, that occur for at least 5% of um, uh, physicians, patients, in order for them to be able to qualify for the EHR incentive dollars. So that's an important um, capability to have and to understand. And of course, um, the um, health information exchange organizations uh, are going to play a big role in being able to meet that as well. Oops. So uh, the rest of the story. Um, the first one's kind of a, a no-brainer statement. Obviously, if we can adopt EHR, we're going to enable electronic access to data. It's not going to be in paper anymore. And, um, and of course, that even though it's a no-brainer, there's um, some of those systems may not, you have to be careful with the system you're using. But if you stay, stick to the certified EHR technology, you should be fine. But technology isn't, isn't um, the end-all, be-all. I mean, it's, it's really going, it's necessary, but you really have to look at your patient populations, make sure you're providing appropriate care and optimal outcomes. And so that's when quality gets improved, is when you look at the data um, and you can kind of connect the dots and, and see how you're doing across a number of measures. So I must um, hate to show this last slide, but I, I think that everyone should know and be aware um, that um, though there's we talk a lot about the meaningful use incentives and uh, being important to improving uh, patient care and, and perhaps making things more efficient for providers and services and, and, and all those things we hope are, are true. But at the crux of all of this change is a change. We have to make a change in the way our health care is paid for in this country. And so um, you can't make a change. You can't move to a value-based um, um, purchasing payment plan for to reimburse services unless you have data to base that value on. And so all of the programs that have um, been become uh, more common have kind of popped up since 2006. You have your e-prescribing program, you have PQRS, which started out as PVRP and then was PQRI, and now it's PQRS, just in case you were on a different stage there. Um, and then you have the Meaningful Use Incentive Programs. And all of these programs are providing data um, to, to help to inform a value-based purchasing program. Um, and to be able to publicly report 
um, provider quality. And so I just put this web, this is a, a current website. It's the Physician Compare website. If you go out to the website now, you won't see any, any meaningful use data or PQRS data um, for the physicians. Um, if you were to go to the website and look up hospital compare or look up nursing home compare, you would see data and you ha would have the option of comparing facilities based on their quality data. And so that's where we're headed with physician data. Um, so there's my contact information and I'd be happy to, to try and answer any questions you have.